So I have an update for you. Last Saturday, May 15th, I gathered with 20, well, maybe seven other teachers to play two games of poker. Evan, even at six months old, showed great interest in the game, or at least in putting as many cards and chips in his mouth as he possibly could. My boy even tried swiping stray chips my way when no one was looking, but he got caught red-handed. Despite this setback, I won the second of those games because of using what I learned from two classes on the Masterclass platform. Multi-time World Series poker champions Daniel Negranu and Phil Ivey's Masterclasses on Texas Hold'em helps me grow fundamentally sound and maybe even a little advanced at Texas Hold'em. There are hundreds of other experts who can help you grow various professional skills or your abilities in various hobbies. Check out Masterclass today using my link in the show notes. If you treat yourself to Masterclass using that link, you'll also be supporting the show. This is Forgotten Wars. At the cost of around 1,500 casualties, almost all on February 18th, while Kitchener wielded his men recklessly, the British dealt the Boers a crippling defeat. General Christian de Vette remembered the surrender like this, quote, No pen can describe the effect on the burghers. On every face there was dejection and despair to be seen. The demoralization, I cannot reiterate it enough, prevailed right through until the end of the war. End quote. Just like that, 4,000 war prisoners sent into exile to an island over 1,000 miles away. Just like that, 10% of the existing war forces removed from the field. Hundreds and hundreds more would return home. Many of the war progressives in both republics who had been reluctant to go to war in the first place now appeared prophetic. The whole of the Boer War effort looked like it could crumble completely. With Pete Cronier on his way, with 4,000 others to St. Helena, and Pete Yobert near death, Free State President Martina Stain and Transvaal President Paul Creer had little choice now to turn over the waging of war to younger leaders. Louis Buota took the title of Commandant General of the Transvaal. Christian de Vett in the Orange Free State. Cus de la Rey gained more authority, and the Transvaal State Attorney, Jan Smuts, got the chance to prove himself as a leader of men in the field. Nassen writes, quote, De la Rey and de Vett had the biblical inspiration of a fundamentalist Christian warriorhood, zealous in belief that by opposing British imperialism, They were on a crusade for the Lord. Both veterans of the 1880s conflict with Britain, they had already demonstrated a flair for running swift movements in the field. End quote. This war would be over if this new crop of leaders didn't deliver. This new crop of war warrior leaders faced war morale that lay at an all-time low. Creer grew so desperate that he threatened to use police reserves to shoot war deserters if necessary. So what were the wars to do now? Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks, act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. 
What the Boers were to do now depended on what Lord Roberts was going to do. And Lord Roberts wanted to take a knife to where he believed the Boer hearts were. The capitals of their republics. The Boer republics appeared as other European opponents had appeared to the British, with defined capitals at their center. Lord Roberts believed that bringing Bloemfontein and Pretoria to their knees would finish off the Boers. But Lord Roberts's 40 years of experience came in India. General Redfur's Buller had fought alongside Boers some 20 years before and anticipated something very different from Lord Roberts. Buller believed the Boers would engage in guerrilla warfare like American colonists had over 100 years before. Buller thought the Republican territory covered too much ground dotted by too many rural communities to fold when their capitals fell. It was only a matter of time before one of these generals was proven right. As Roberts closed in on Bloemfontein, Christian de Vett decided to disrupt the British horde as much as possible. He managed to entrench five to 6,000 commandos at Poplar Grove. They dug in along a 10-mile front on both sides of the Madere River, about 30 miles east of Kimberley. Lord Roberts, with 30,000 men and over 100 guns, tried to immediately implement what he learned at Paderberg. He sent French's cavalry and other mounted infantry to make a 17-mile loop around the Boers' east flank and then attack the Boers from the rear, from where Roberts believed the Boers would make an escape through. After French's mounted men made this loop, three infantry divisions would attack using creeping barrage tactics, meaning the artillery would strike just enough ahead of the British infantry to keep war heads down as much as possible until British infantry had almost closed in on the Boers. As a side note, I had previously read that these creeping barrage tactics first emerged in World War I, and then I taught this to my sophomore world history students. Turns out these creeping barrage tactics emerged at least as early as 1900, when Buller successfully used these against the Boers in the Battle of Peter's Heights, a.k.a. Tugela Heights. Anyway, Lord Roberts planned to use these creeping barrage tactics to avoid atrocious losses that his chief of staff, Lord Kitchener, recklessly reaped on February 18th at Paderberg. Lord Roberts hoped to score another big bag of war captives through this encirclement. What Lord Roberts didn't know was that President Paul Creer showed up in his top hat, to the Boer camp to inspire them to fight on. What Lord Roberts also did not know is something that Devet could only have vaguely anticipated, but hoped against. At 3 a.m. on March 7th, the British mounted men made their move. Boers along the whole defensive line began to withdraw as the Boers realized that the British were trying to encircle them as withdrawals at some positions made holding other positions impossible. Devet was busy meeting with President Creer while all these retreats unfolded. Nothing Devet did could stop this left flank from running for Bloemfontein, so Devet sent Creer on the run as well to avoid capture. But Lord Roberts's own men didn't stick to the plan either. Major General French decided his men's horses were too weary to make the full loop behind war lines. So French broke off their loop early and sent his force careening towards where the main body of the Boers was. French also pulled Brigadier General Robert Broadwood's cavalry from their advanced positions behind war lines for this attack at the center. This initiative by French left a hole wide enough for fleeing Boers to run through, toward Bloemfontein. Boer snipers also slowed French's weary cavalry enough to prevent the capture of any Boers. French also slowed his cavalry himself by having them advance at a walk, even dismounted, 
So French had many of his cavalrymen fighting on foot, making it much easier for de Vett's ad hoc rear guard snipers to slow their advance. The Boer force didn't wait to be surrounded and captured. They lived to fight another day. Lord Roberts was furious. Blame went back and forth between him and his officers. Roberts said this about Major General French, quote, We should have had a good chance of making the two presidents prisoner if French had carried out my orders of making straight for Madera River instead of wasting valuable time going after small parties of the enemy, end quote. Roberts also accused French of running his horses into the ground. French was furious. He blamed the breakdown of his horses on Roberts's disruptive changes to the transport system. French's chief of staff, one Douglas Haig, said, quote, I have never seen horses so beat as ours that day. They have been only having eight pounds of oats a day and practically starving since February 11th. End quote. Haig blamed this on Roberts diverting some of their allotted feed to other colonial cavalry corps that Roberts raised. Roberts also blamed Lieutenant General Kelly Kenny for moving his infantry too slowly against the Boers. But Kelly Kenny, in turn, blamed the dehydration and near starvation brought by DeVette's earlier capture of 200 British supply wagons on Roberts's mismanagement. Since then, Kelly Kenny's men only had one water cart for each battalion to share. The British won the Battle of Poplar Grove, but the Boers only suffered 50, or only two casualties, depending on which historian you ask. Regardless, Praetorius writes that, quote, the seeds of the future guerrilla warfare had been sown. End quote. Pakenham writes this about the Battle of Poplar Grove's aftermath. Quote, Whoever was to blame, the effects of the Battle of Poplar Grove were disastrous and long-lasting for the British. Not only did Roberts fail to catch Creer and the rest, he also made the crucial deduction from the panic-stricken way the Boers had fled that the Boers' morale was broken and the war nearly over. End quote. Roberts thought he saw his deduction confirmed three days later, this time at Driefontein. Here, Lord Roberts gathered a storm of 34,000 men, 39 machine guns, and 112 guns to rain on around 3,000 Boers who tried to slow the British advance on Bloemfontein. De Vett and Cus de la Rey did the best they could, leading their men outnumbered about 10 to 1. Ultimately, Delaray led 1,500 commandos in a clash against French's 10,000 cavalry. But by the afternoon of March 10th, war defenders started to trickle away in the face of heavy British shell and rifle fire. The trickle turned to a torrent by 6 p.m. when the final British punch landed. Both sides accused each other of disgrace afterwards. Praetorius reports the following, quote, A white flag incident apparently occurred toward the end of the battle. According to the Times history, a handful of Boers indicated that they wanted to surrender, whereupon the Buffs, the British, eager to take the prisoners, attracted heavy fire from elsewhere and suffered severe casualties. However, both DeVette's official report of March 11th and the article in the Standard and Diggers News claim that it was the British troops who hoisted the white flag that enabled them to take the Boer positions at Driefontein. End quote. Regardless, the Boer retreat left the door wide open for the British to march through to Bloemfontein. At Driefontein, the British suffered a little over 400 casualties, while the Boers suffered about 100. As the British advanced on Bloemfontein, some of their units mirrored the performance of war invaders in Natal just months earlier. Some of these British units began looting, began gutting livestock, and began burning burger homes and crops. A wide trail of letters from home, empty biscuit tins, 
and dead horses snaked for about 100 miles from Kimberley to Bloemfontein, a town of about 4,000. On March 13th, the pro-British sector of Bloemfontein cheered wildly and played God Save the Queen and Soldiers of the Queen. Why? I'll let Maria Bomberger, whose father came from a primarily Afrikaans family, describe what she learned from afar in Port Elizabeth. Quote, Tonight we were awakened by hearing a gunfire and the hooters, steam whistles, etc. The long-looked-for news has come at last. Bloemfontein has been taken by our troops, Lord Roberts, without a shot being fired. It is splendid news indeed. Mother and I got up, and I sat on the balcony till one o'clock, mother sitting by the open window, listening to the cheering, singing, bells, etc. It was a perfect moonlit night, so calm and so bright. Amidst all the noise and distant voices, we heard the soft cooing of a turtle dove, which sounded like a message of peace in the calm of the night. Maria writes less happily in her journal a day later, quote, This has been a day never to be forgotten. After breakfast, I went to town with the McAndrews, came home, had something to eat, went down again half past eleven, came home at one. After dinner, I asked my father if he would allow me to hang a flag over the balcony, whereupon he stormed at me and threatened to strike me, calling me most insulting names, got hold of my poor, delicate mother by the arm so severely that it has left quite a bruise. Oh, what a coward and a tyrannizing tyrant. Never, so never will I forget this day. Have felt quite ill since. Cruel world and still more cruel parents. End quote. Rarely do you hear rejoicing followed by such swift, severe punishment. Punishment from a parent, no less. President Stain escaped Bloemfontein on March 12th, on the eve of the capital's fall, on one of the last trains to leave before the British cut the rail line. Former Speaker of the Free State Folks Rod, John Fraser, and Bloemfontein's Mayor, B.O. Kellner, formally handed over the town to Lord Roberts on March 13th. President Stain's presidential residence became Lord Roberts and his wife's new home for a time. Lord Roberts made sure that favorable press coverage captured this peaceful transfer in a favorable light. So, Winston Churchill was not allowed in Roberts' retinue. Union Jacks rose all over Bloemfontein. Pro-British residents celebrated. British soldiers saw women for the first time in months. Some soldiers remembered three pretty girls passing out cigarettes. Sutu laborers celebrated, some by looting the Orange Free State Artillery Corps barracks and other war property. March 13th marked another depressing day for war warriors. Christian de Vette describes war spirits again, this time after the fall of Bloemfontein. Quote, not only was it that the English had occupied our capital, but what was of more concern was what happened to the burghers. They were utterly dejected, and it seemed as if they did not have the heart to offer the least resistance anymore. End quote. Boer resistance leaders grasped at straws that month of March. Many Boer leaders and publications suggested dynamiting the gold mines to deprive the Brits of the precious resources these mines held. Creer and other cooler heads on this issue prevailed, though, and opted to keep the gold mines running and squeeze as much revenue from the gold mine owners as they could. Free State President Stain hoped that Russia would take advantage of the heavy British troop investment in South Africa by making a move on India. Maybe then the British would come more flexibly to the negotiating table with the Boers with their precious crown jewel in the balance. Maybe if the Boers could hold on just a couple more months, things could end differently. The Transvaal dispatched A.W. Volmorans and C.H. Vessels, while the Free State dispatched Abraham Fisher to try to gain foreign support elsewhere. 
Their blood cousins in the Netherlands received them warmly, and some famous leaders like famed theologian, journalist, and leader of the anti-revolutionary party and future prime minister, Abraham Kuyper, voiced support for the Boers. But the Dutch government was not willing to risk enraging the leader of the free trade world, the British Empire. Not unless by some long shot that Kaiser Wilhelm II would raise his voice in a call for some sort of anti-British bloc on behalf of the Boers. But Germany wasn't all that interested in sticking their necks out unless they could be confident that the United States would use its growing flow of money and gold flowing to London as leverage. But for a host of reasons, the Anglo-American bond was too strong to expect that. So about all that the Republic's diplomats and Willem Lades managed to accomplish was the following. Convincing major world powers to refuse to acknowledge the upcoming British annexations of the Boer Republics, preventing Transvaal government funds in Europe from falling into British hands, and netting some minimal financial support through some private funding drives. The Boers would remain on their own against the most powerful empire in the world. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Bloemfontein's new occupants. Lord Roberts's 50,000 exhausted, malnourished troops could not find enough beds in a town with less than 5,000 occupants before the British showed up. Typhoid fever reared its ugly head, transforming Bloemfontein from a town full of victors into a military hospital. By April, 1,000 British troops lay dead after the first of many disease outbreaks. Dr. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, yes, that's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who started writing Sherlock Holmes books over a decade earlier, that Dr. Conan Doyle cared for some patients struck by typhoid fever. Roberts showed little aptitude in putting people with any competence or empathy in charge of administering the army hospitals. To make matters worse for these poor men, Roberts still hadn't fixed his supply issues. So surrounding farms were legally looted after already losing laborers in the weeks before. Many of these Brits marched into Bloemfontein in tattered uniforms and with their boots so worn down that their feet burst out of the sides while they walked. Roberts opted to wait for his force to rest and resupply in Bloemfontein. He wanted them ready to drive the stake into what he believed to be the Boer's other heart, less than 300 miles away, Praetoria. Roberts wrote optimistically about his belief that the war was not far from over. Roberts offered Boers in a 10-mile radius of Bloemfontein, and then Boers throughout all of the Orange Free State, the following. Return home. Lay down your arms. Take an oath of allegiance to the British or risk losing all of your property. Some wars took this offer, but General Buller marshaled his many months of experience among the Boers to write the following about the Boer mentality when it came to their government and homes. Quote, Time has not yet glorified the seat of government with a halo sentiment. To every man, his own home is the capital. Hence, there is no commanding center by the occupation of which the whole country or even a whole district can be brought into subjection. No vital spot at which a single blow can be struck that will paralyze every member of the body. There are living organisms which can be divided into a multitude of fragments without destroying the individual life of each fragment. End quote. Buller advised Roberts to crush the Free State Commandos still in the field before moving on Praetoria. Otherwise, the Commandos would close behind the Brits like a river's water closing behind a man walking through the river. So what did Roberts do with this advice? I'll answer that with my most extensive excerpt from Pakenham yet. It succinctly sets the scene better than I ever could. Pakenham starts by telling us the estimated war warriors still in the field in mid-March. Quote, 
The Boer forces in the field, according to Roberts's intelligence department, have been reduced to a total of about 37,000 in mid-March. The actual numbers were probably still smaller. The largest single concentration was still believed to be the Boer invasion force in Natal, 13,000, most of whom were now dug in to the line of Bihar'sberg, 40 miles north of Ladysmith. In Cape Colony, a raiding party of about 1,000 burghers, led by General Steenkamp, had set alight a local Afrikaner rebellion. The other Boer forces had, by March 17th, abandoned their posts south of the Orange River after blowing up both the strategic railway bridges that linked Bloemfontein with the three Cape ports. The total of war forces still occupying British territory was thus estimated at 15,500, including General Snayman's band of 1,500, still ineffectually besieging Baden-Powell at Mafeking. 21,500 other burghers were believed to be scattered around the Free State. There were thought to be 5,000 to 6,000 led by De Vette and De La Rey, who had abandoned their trenches and fled north from Bloemfontein. There was a large force under General Dutoy to the north of Kimberley, and 4,000 men under General Olifiel were known to have abandoned Colesberg at the end of February, and to have retreated somewhere to the northeast. It was these commandos of Oli Fields, above all, that would have been a prime target for offensive strategy if Roberts's priority had been to crush the Boer armies in the Free State. For Oli Field was trapped a hundred miles behind the main British lines. But Roberts had decided to consolidate his position by halting at Bloemfontein until he could build up a still larger army ready for the march on Praetoria. His strategy was, for the moment, defensive, to protect Bloemfontein from a raid by De Vette from the north, to reopen the town's waterworks 20 miles east, and to reopen the railway line to the south. He ordered Buller to remain on the defensive in Natal. Buller protested, Violently. Where Roberts did take the initiative, his aims were political. He sent out small parties of troops into the country to distribute the proclamations of amnesty and to collect surrendered arms. End quote. On March 15th, Roberts received a grand opportunity in the form of important intelligence. Roberts learned that General Olifiel was moving six to 7,000 wars from Kohlsberg and Stormberg up a road that passes 40 miles east of Bloemfontein. More reports confirmed this intelligence over several days. Roberts waited nearly a week before moving any of his exhausted 34,000-man army in Bloemfontein. On March 20th, in what appeared a half-hearted gesture, Roberts sent a cavalry brigade a few guns, and some mounted infantry to block Olifiel. Olifiel's 24-mile-long train of wagons managed to evade Roberts's mounted men and escape from behind enemy lines. This looked like a huge failure, or at least a huge miscalculation on Roberts's part. Pakenham writes the following, quote, even Roberts's keenest admirers admitted that the main reason why he did not try to crush Olifiel was that he thought the Free State Burgers would, if simply left to themselves, accept the amnesty, take the oath of allegiance, and disperse to their homes. It was this preconceived belief that the fall of Bloemfontein would knock all the fight out of the Free State, which was to be his fundamental miscalculation. End quote. Roberts also badly misjudged that his army would be ready to move in a short time. He and Kitchener's transport system was a total mess with a 100-mile-long bottleneck near Bloemfontein where only one railway track ran. 
Roberts ridiculed Buhler in December when Buhler suggested extending a Cape Railway to make a new westerly route to Bloemfontein. Now, according to Pakenham, more of Roberts' men were dying because of this slowed flow of supplies than men who had died at the disastrous Battle of Spionkop. Meanwhile, the new men at the top of the war military command faced challenges of their own. Though Roberts made many mistakes that first half of 1900, he did succeed in convincing 12 to 14,000 war warriors to accept his offer and lay down their arms between March and July of 1900. So the Boers lost about triple what they had at Paderberg. What were Christian de Vett, Louis Boita, and Jan Smuts to do? They sought to increase the speed, discipline, and initiative of their commandos. De Vett stripped the command of commandants who refused to get rid of their ox wagon transports. If you were insubordinate, De Vett wanted you disciplined severely, maybe even in a military court. These new leaders couldn't afford slow columns that the British could easily encircle, like they did at Paderberg. They needed mobile, disciplined warriors who would finally engage in guerrilla warfare consistently. Warriors who showed selfless patriotism to their republics, like a kind of Protestant samurai. These new commandos needed to do the hunting, not wait for the British to hunt and surround them. Next episode, at Corn Sprite, you will hear whether waging guerrilla warfare worked. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind-the-mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash forgotten wars. That is patreon.com slash forgotten wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated.